Hi, I'm Chris Franklin. And I'm Rosalind Moss. I was raised fundamentalist. And I was raised Jewish. So what are we both doing in my kitchen with this beautiful statue? <laughs> Stay with us and you'll find out here on Household of Faith. Welcome to Household of Faith. Roz, you and I met, what, about four and a half years ago, I four years ago? I think Was almost three and a half, uh, three and a half. We yeah. met, we met at a luncheon for converts and we were sitting next to each other right. and we found out that we had entered the church on the very same day. Right, and we didn't even know each we other. We didn't know Easter each other. Easter 95. That's right, mm -hmm. and I recognized your New Yorker accent <laughs> and that was interesting to me. Um, I remember I remember sitting there and being so fascinated by your conversion story that it just blanked out everything else I was listening to. So when I was asked to do this show, I thought I would love to have you do it with me. Uh, so that's why I asked you. And, um, and Chris, I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled no end to do this with you. Uh, it's exciting to think that we're going to be able to yeah. go over all, these, all the topics that were so touchy for us as we were coming to the Catholic faith, um, Mary and the Eucharist, yeah. the priesthood, all Touchy of these things. and painful. Painful and yeah. difficult and yeah. ugh, how can this be? Yeah. But you know, I'd like our friends to be able to share in your journey like I did. And if you wouldn't mind, just take a few minutes to, to tell me once again how you came from Judaism to agnosticism to evangelical Christianity yeah. to the Catholic faith. Could I take four hours, do you uh, mind? Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> It took me 51 years. Uh, it was a long journey for me. And um, I came to what I thought for 18 years as an evangelical was the very whore of Babylon. I hate to even say Yikes. it now, but <laughs> that's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. To what is the pearl of great price. Yep. Worth giving up everything for. Well, uh, you're I'm cry. a mess, I won't be able to tell you. <laughs> but um, so being raised in a Jewish home, we sat down to the Passover table waiting for the Messiah every year knowing he was the only hope that the world had. And as you said, I became an agnostic in my older years. Is there a God? Isn't there a God? How right. do you know? How is knowing ever going to make a difference in your life? I was 32 years old before I ever met such a creature <laughs> as a Jewish person who believed that Jesus Christ was in fact the Jewish Messiah, had come to earth and was not the Messiah only, but God come to earth. And you said, oy vey. I said, oy vey. <laughs> and I said, how could it be that we're waiting for him? He came to earth and nobody knows he was here. I'd never heard this before. Mm -hmm. No one has a clue. He was supposed to set up his kingdom. Nothing happened. Where's the peace? And he left. There'd be nothing left. There'd be absolutely no hope left. It was an insanity. So were but you skeptical? Uh, slightly, <laughs> slightly. But because these, what I thought were neurotic Jews at uh -huh. the time, uh, they had such a, I knew that what they lived for was what they would also die for. And they told mm -hmm. me that God entered history to bring us home to him. And if it was possible to know why we're on the earth, if in case they were on to something, mm -hmm. I followed their neuroses for 10 months. <laughs> and one life-changing night, Chris, it was, um, 1976, mm -hmm. and this was the night that sort of did it for me. I was at the table with 12 of these believing Jewish evangelical Christians. And I said to them, for 10 months they said, Christ died for your sins, the sins of the world. I, don't, I said to them, people, I don't know what the language is that you're talking about, yeah. but let's say for the sake of discussion it happened. Christ died for your sins, my sins, I don't know what that means, but my question then is, let's say it happened, why did he do it? 
What was in his mind? What, what if? for? What for? Right. And when I asked that, they took me through the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, which I never knew through all my years in my young Jewish home and all my years in the synagogue. And when you say the sacrificial system, you mean the Jewish practice of religion where they sacrificed animals. Yes. To, to atone for their sins. Yes. The, the law of Moses. Yes, right, exactly. From the Old Testament. From the Old Testament, okay. which I didn't know growing up because huh. the, what the Old Testament law said is that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sin. I grew up in the synagogue. We never killed an animal. We never saw blood shed. Mm -hmm. I never knew blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sin. Okay. And they explained to me that because we're sinners, God is holy, he can't come into the presence of sin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we've earned by our sin is death, separation from God. And so if we got what was coming to us, we'd be separated from God for all eternity. Uh -huh. But um, because God is a loving God, he cannot come into the presence of sin, but he created us for a relationship with him. And they told me that night, that life-changing night, how God in his love without compromising his holiness, uh, provided the way for us to come back into that relationship with him. And they showed me at the foot of Mount Sinai God, when God brought the children of Israel across from Egypt, uh -huh. uh, God had Moses set up an altar. And they explained to me that night how the people would bring animals, bulls, goats, lambs, whatever the sacrifice required to that altar. Mm -hmm. And if it was a lamb, like the Passover lamb would be, the Passover lamb had to be a male, it had to be a year, it had to be an absolutely perfect offering, the best of the flock without blemish, without spot, perfect. The individual would bring the lamb. And they put their hand on the head of that little lamb. And it was an act of identification. Mm -hmm. It was symbolic of the sin passing from the individual onto that little animal. Mm -hmm. And that little lamb, who was perfect, but who symbolically had taken upon itself the sin of this person, was slain. And the blood of that animal was shed on the altar as an offering to God in payment for this person's sin. Okay. And I thought, now, why? Why would God want an innocent animal put to death for my sin, put me to death? I didn't understand it. it but it began to get through to me that sin is no light issue to God right. that he would do that. But with that, they told me, Chris, that the blood of bulls and goats and lambs could never take away sin ultimately. In other words, they had to do this every year, right? Over and over, over and over, and over again. Over and over and over again. Over. And, the, and the, they were kapoor, the Hebrew word for covering. They were a covering and they were a sign that not, not only could they not take away the sin of the person ultimately, they couldn't perfect the worshiper. Okay. They, they could not change the heart. Mm -hmm. They could do nothing to help that worshiper not continue to sin. Mm -hmm. But they were a sign, all thousands and millions of those animals yeah. and lambs slain, wow. who would point to the one who would one day come and take upon himself not the sin of a person for a time, but the sin of all men for all time. And this is that Messiah you were waiting for. I didn't know it. Right. But they went, see all that time they stayed uh -huh. in the Old Testament because okay. they didn't go in the New Testament because they knew I didn't think it right. was a kosher book. Right. <laughs> but now they went to one verse in the New Testament when John the Baptist came and Jesus said to him, behold, looked at him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the lamb to which every Old Testament lamb pointed. And when they said that, John 1, 29, mm -hmm. I was shattered on the spot. I couldn't talk. I couldn't stand. Uh, I couldn't <laughs> believe what I had just begun to understand. I, you know what it was for me? If you could picture an old curtain, uh -huh. a tattered old curtain with little holes in the curtain on a stage, and through 10 months, a little shaft of light coming through the hole, when they said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it was as if someone pulled the curtain, exposed the stage, there and is. I knew it happened. And I thought, if one little lamb under the Old Testament sacrificial system could take upon itself the sin of a person for a time, mm -hmm. what then could the blood of God's Son do, who he, picture, Christ on the cross, uh -huh. he, the Lamb of God, the Lamb, and our sins transferred to him, right. slain for us. My hang up all this time was a man can't be God. A man mm. can't be God. 
and I realized that night for the first time, a man can't be God. Right. But if God is, if God exists, God could become a man, and I'm not going to tell him how <laughs> to be God. Right. It was uh, oh, a couple of months after that, I think, before I could work through fears and pride yeah. and stuff and give my life to this incomparable lamb who changed my life overnight. I was a Martian on planet Earth overnight. Mm. I jumped into every Bible study, every outreach. The <laughs> world had to know. Uh, my first Bible study was taught by an ex-Catholic who was taught by an ex-priest who taught me straight off mm -hmm. that the Catholic Church was a cult, a false religious system leading millions astray. I believed it. It was the uh, it, the whore of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And for the next 14 years, I tried to save every Catholic I could find, yeah. whole families to bring them out of what I believed with all my heart was a false religious system in order that they might come into a personal relationship mm. with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was in the summer of 1970, um, 1990. First I came to Christ in 1976 as an evangelical. It was in the summer of 1990 that God, in one split moment of time, through a series of incidences, penetrated my anti-Catholic heart and set me on a compelling course to find out if the Catholic Church is in fact what it claims to be mm -hmm. the church Christ established 2,000 years ago. It was a four and a half year, heart-rending, agonizing journey yeah. that led me to his church. And I know through our time together in these weeks, yeah. we'll talk about many parts of that journey for both of mm -hmm. us, but the, the, the uh, statement that just rings over and over again in my head is the statement that a very wonderful bishop, his name is Archbishop Fulton Sheen, made that said that there are not a hundred people in America who hate the Catholic Church, but there are millions who hate what they mistakenly think the Catholic Church teaches. Yeah, it's true. That was me. I it's hated true. what I thought it taught. But I have now, I, I think, I, in two sentences, Chris, I have all of creation restored to me. I have all of, Christ, all of Christ. I have all of creation, the communion of saints, a mother, and not just a mother, but a Jewish mother who uh -huh. is mine. <laughs> the unbelievable condescension of a God who not only gave himself for us on Calvary, but who gives himself to us as our daily food. Mm -hmm. And people say to me, my evangelical friends, Roz, what were you missing as an evangelical? And I would say, as an evangelical, I was missing nothing that I knew of. Right. What I have, what we have, is not other than Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not more than Christ. I have, it's what St. Augustine said, I have now the whole Christ, all that he intended. But so do you, <laughs> so do you. And we entered the same Easter Vigil mm -hmm. of 1995. Yes, we, did. we didn't know each other. And you were raised in a fundamentalist. That's right. If, if there's ever a Webster's defini definition of anti-Catholic, a fundamentalist, fundamentalist home. Yes. Whatever made you make such a journey? Well, you know, I know the reason I'm Catholic is because my mother taught me to love the Bible and to love Jesus with all my heart. I knew from the time I was, I can remember that God loved me, that God heard my prayers. I knew I was a sinner, that I needed a savior. I knew the Bible was true. When I was five years old, I asked Jesus to be my savior. That was the way we talked about it. I got born again. My mother said, if you ask Jesus to open the little door in your heart and come in, he will, and you'll go to heaven. It's absolutely guaranteed. There's no getting out of it. Once you're born again, you are born again. And a five-year-old is so open, it's simple, of it's course. pure, it's true. That's right. So I did. I was five years old, and I, I got born again at that time. Um, another thing that we were taught, which I believe is, is important still to me, is how important it is to care about the souls of other people. We were taught very young to share the gospel. We called it witnessing or giving our testimony um, because we knew that there were real Christians, and that would be people who were born again Christians like ourselves, people who believed like we believed. Um, and then the rest of the world was non-Christians. They weren't believers. 
Um, and in that group of people, we included all the Catholics. Uh, because from the time I was a little girl, I was taught that the Catholic Church was the biggest cult. Yeah. Uh, the people who taught me about God loved God. They were charitable people. But they hated the Catholic Church for what they thought, like you said, like what they thought, thought it was. So uh, one of the big emphases in our church in growing up was missions. I, well, missionaries were big heroes. My brother was a missionary. You were a missionary. I was a missionary. Well, my brother was a missionary in Spain and Mexico and El Salvador because he went to save Catholics who were not Christians, like Hindus and Buddhists. So when I grew up, I wanted to be a missionary. I went to Bible college. I met a man who was interested in missions, and mm. we got married. And in 1991, we got on a plane, and we flew to Costa Rica to be missionaries. Well, we went to Guatemala a year after that, thinking we were going to preach the gospel, Jesus saves. And with, a we were, with a neon sign, sign from the Jesus moon. Saves, and that we were I've been bring, wanting to do that since <laughs> I met Christ. We were going to bring the simple gospel to yes. the people, these poor Catholics who didn't know Jesus Christ. And I thought when we got there, all the missionaries would be teaching this simple gospel, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But what I found was that some people taught babies should be baptized, some people thought, taught babies shouldn't be baptized, some taught you got to speak in tongues to be saved, some taught that speaking in tongues is from the devil. Here so, you go to preach yeah. the simple gospel and There's what no is such it? Thing. And the world is hearing multiple... That's right. There were people who believed in women pastors, people who taught the Bible says no women pastors. And here's the bottom line, they all used the same Bible. Yeah. They all used the same Bible. And they had hundreds of versions of Christianity. And I remember thinking, it can't be right. That isn't the nature of God to have so many voices. He's not There's the author one of church. There's yeah. one faith. There's one baptism. Yes. And so I just wanted to be a better missionary. I started to read church history, uh-oh, <laughs> because I wanted to know how the early church evangelized. The downfall of Protestantism That's right. to read church history. <laughs> so I started to read church history, and what I realized really scared me because it was nothing like American evangelicalism. It was nothing like what we were teaching. It was, um, it was totally Catholic. Mm. So that's where the journey began, I guess. My oh husband my and I with a lot of fear. And you saw that it was totally Catholic, even though you really hadn't studied the Catholic Church. I was scared, church. very scared, yeah. but I had to know the truth. And I knew the truth would stand up to scrutiny. And so we scrutinized Brave for a long you. time. That's the thing. I fear too, but we never need to be afraid of the truth. And then one day, we had to go to a priest and say, we're born-again Christians, but we need to be Catholic. Mm. And he said, only the Holy Spirit could do this. <laughs> Welcome home. Uh, so that's, that's a in a nutshell, priest. how I got into the Catholic Church. It, it is home. So, Chris, it's good to be home yes, with you. Yes, it really is. It's good to be together. <laughs> it's just so good. Well, Roz, we need to take a break right yeah. now. When we get back, we'll talk about what you can look forward to in the next 15 episodes of Household of Faith. We'll be right back. It's not only doctrinal issues that separate the Catholic from the Protestant. It's a way of seeing. It's a whole it's a culture. It's a whole new right. world. Right. It's a whole new world. I'm re I read the Bible and with new eyes, mm -hmm. almost as I never read it before. Yeah, me too. Just so wonderful. Hi. Welcome back to Household of Faith. Roz, let's give them an idea of what's coming up in the next 15 programs. 15 topics that aged me <laughs> <laughs> for four and a half years on no my kidding. route to the Catholic Church. Just about everything, Chris, Mary, Oive, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, everybody would sing uh, Ave Maria, I would sing Oive oh, Maria, no. right? Oh, Mary and purgatory and tradition and, and uh, actually just run them down even in order. I think next week we're going to look at the church Christ founded. Uh -huh, There's 26,000 uh -huh. Protestant denominations uh, against one church mm -hmm. that has stood for mm -hmm. 2,000 years. I'm especially glad we're going to be talking about the things that are really totally foreign to our Protestant brothers and sisters. Oh, right. <laughs> like prayer to the saints. Do we mm. worship them? Do we worship Mary? We're going to talk about those things, yes. those things that were so difficult for us to see from the Catholic point of view, because yes. it really is a matter of seeing. It is a matter of seeing, Chris, and it's one thing that I realized on my way to the church. It's not only doctrinal issues that separate the Catholic from the Protestant. It's a way of seeing. It's a whole it's culture. It's a whole new right. world. Right. It's a whole new world. I'm re I read the Bible 
and with new eyes, mm -hmm. almost as I never read it before. Yeah, me too. Just so wonderful. Me too. And the papacy, and the priesthood. Didn't, don't you love seeing the Pope on TV now? Uh, it's just like, that's my holy my father, papa, my, my papa. papa. My shepherd and, and my earthly I, shepherd. And what I never knew before was that when I was a Protestant, he was my papa too. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know yes, that. Yes, that I God is such a father that he would care for his children by fathering right. them on earth and giving us right. a man. And, a and what about calling, calling a guy father? I know. You know, we were taught that you call no man father. No, except and your own father. Except your own right. father. But and but when I became a Catholic, it was really hard for me to call the priest father. I, I couldn't I was, say it. It was hard to do because of my background. I couldn't do it, Chris. I know. I used to sit in the back of the church and listen to the people come in the church saying, good morning, father, hi, father. I couldn't get the word out, but it became to me the sound of sheep. It oh, became wow. the most beautiful sound in the world. And the fact that I couldn't say father, it began to make me think nothing's wrong with them. Yeah. I'm missing something. I can't say bye oh. yet. That's what it was for me. <laughs> I love saying father. Yeah. I so love do I. saying father. So do I. You know, I another thing that um, we're going to talk about that was really important to both of us as we've gotten to know each other was the idea of the Bible alone. Oh, boy. You know, so many people scripture. think we go by the Bible alone. Right. That's true Christianity. But right. the fact is, nobody uses the Bible alone. That's one of the things I discovered yeah. when I was in Guatemala. It's like, we've been saying Bible alone, Bible alone. That's all I've heard all my life. And nobody does it. It's right. not possible. Right. And if we use the Bible alone, we both came to re realize we, we wouldn't know what the Bible is because the Bible doesn't tell us what the Bible That's is. Right. It doesn't come with a table of contents. It's a big content. puzzle, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So what else? Um, we're going to look at women's roles Good. and evangelization, which is what you began with as a five-year-old. That's right. So saving all the neighbor kids. And now, and now to give the whole gospel to the whole world. Yeah. What an incredible privilege it is, Chris. I used to think when I came to Christ, I would walk down the streets of Los Angeles where I lived at the time, and I would look at all the people and I'd say, why me? Why did God save me? Yeah. I had no reason to live before I knew Christ. Why me and not them? Why not the people that are committing suicide and yeah. are hurting? Why me? Grace. And now grace, grace. Grace, grace. And <laughs> having been an evangelical when I thought there was nothing more to be had but heaven, mm -hmm. and now I say, why me? There are men, godly, holy, evangelical Protestant pastors who taught me who were my mentors for whom I will be eternally grateful. And they swim circles around me, even theologically. Yeah. Why me again? Yeah. Why did God bring me into the fullness of his faith? It's a it's mystery, grace. Roz. That's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> Quit <laughs> trying to figure it out. <laughs> and that's how I know the Catholic Church is the fulfillment of Judaism. Because when I was growing up, if I asked my Jewish mother a question, Ma, why do we do this? Where does this come from? What does a Jewish mother say? Don't ask. Right? <laughs> And it's now, a mystery. It's a, <laughs> and now, right, I have a question. I ask a priest, a very special priest in New York. I would say, Father Okada, what, uh, what does this mean? Why? And every once in a while, he would say to me, Roz, there's some things we don't know. It's a mystery. Well, that's the Catholic way of saying don't ask. It's the same <laughs> thing. It's a fulfillment of Judaism. But we both found that we had a lot of questions that were answered in oh. the Catholic faith. Like, I felt like it was a, a, a puzzle box. And I had most of the pu pieces of the puzzle, but there were a lot of holes. And I had accepted that, well, there's holes. The Catholic Church is the whole puzzle. It's all, all the pieces, everything makes sense. It's all And we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about how Catholics can share their faith with other people. Yes. Because this is, this is something we have from our background that's very Catholic, and yes. that is to share the gospel message. And, That's what we want to do. And to respond to those who say to you, have you been born again? That's right. To, to We're going to ask that question, That's aren't we? That's right. We are. We are. We are. And in fact, there's one topic above all, Chris, for me, in any case. On my journey to the church, a very special priest, Father O'Connor in New York, who helped me so immensely. And I went to him, and I was a frightened, mistrusting, evangelical, anti-Catholic. Because the devil could deceive us. Oh, boy. And I, I, I thought know. the church was I true, know. but that scared me that mm -hmm. I thought that. Mm -hmm. And I went to Father O'Connor. I said, I'm not a scholar. How, how am I ever going to know? The papacy and purgatory and community of saints and all of this and mm. apostolic succession, I'm no <laughs> scholar. How will I ever know if the church is true? He said to me, forget if the church is true. I said, what do you mean forget if the church is true? He said, forget it. He said, the issue is the Eucharist. 
No, first he said to me, the issue is Christ. Now, tell me that to me, tell that to us as an right. evangelical. Right. I'll uh, give me that for food. The yeah. issue is Christ. I would never be out of the scripture, not one day in my life. It was Christ to whom I clung my entire journey. So that was my comfort. Mm -hmm. And the issue was Christ. Either the Eucharist is Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, or what Catholics believe is idolatrous worship and needs to be condemned. So it either is or it isn't. That's it. That's there, it. There's no in between. There's no in between. That's the claims right. of the Catholic Church are too immense, like the claims of Christ. Uh, an atheist or someone that doesn't believe in Christ might say, you Christians believe that Jesus mm -hmm, is God. Mm -hmm. He didn't claim. He, you think he's the way. Right. And we'd say, no, no, we don't think that. That's what Christ said. I right. am the way, the truth, and the life. And only someone, if someone comes up to you and says, I'm God, you say, uh, either what did you have mm -hmm, for lunch? Mm -hmm. Or you know Call that... Call 911. Right, C.S. <laughs> Lewis, they're, they're a lunatic. Right. Or they're a liar, mm -hmm. but they're not a God. They're not God. And you can't even call them a good man because good men don't claim to be God. So either Christ is God and you need to fall down and worship him or he's a liar and you need to dismiss him. The same with the church. It is what it claims to be and we are in it or it's not and it's a false idolatrous. That's right. That's right. We have to establish right. what's true and what's not. Yeah, and that's, no what, we, ground that's that. what we did in our journeys. That's what we're going to be sharing in these next 15 programs. Right. This is very I'm exciting. Excited. <laughs> I'm excited, Chris. Yeah. We're going to be just exhausted yes. at the end of this thing. <laughs> right. um, well, uh, Roz, why don't you give us an idea of what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to look next at program. what is the church that Christ established. Is there a way to know that? Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father mm -hmm, are one. Mm -hmm. Is there a way amidst 26,000 Protestant denominations, is there a way to know what God intended when he established his church on earth and is there a way to find that church today? Okay, that sounds like a very important topic. Join us next time on Household of Faith and we're, we're gonna talk about the church that Jesus founded. Can you find it? God bless you, we'll see you next time. <laughs>